Welcome to the Weekly Bioanalysis, a KCAS podcast. Hello and welcome to the seventh episode of the Weekly Bioanalysis. My name is John Perkins. I'm the Senior Scientific Advisor for all things related to LCMS. I have been with KCS for about seven months, shortly to be eight, but I've been in bioanalytical for close to 25 years. I'm here with my co-host, Dominic Guarino. Hello, my name is Dominic Guarino, and I'm the Senior Scientific Advisor for all things related to ligand binding assays and flow cytometry. I've been with KCS for about seven years now, but I've been in the CRO space for close to 15, and in the immunology and gene therapy space for about 25 years. This week, we are excited to have a couple of our KCS colleagues join us on the podcast. Don Dufield and Frank Spriggs have considerable expertise in large molecule and biomarker analysis. We've asked them to join us to give us their perspective. Today's podcast, as always, is brought to you by KCS, Kansas City Analytical Services. KCS is a bioanalytical laboratory located in Kansas City, serving the pharmaceutical and biotech industries for over 40 years now. Dominic and I are senior scientific advisors at KCS, as we've mentioned many, many times before, and either or both of us are available to answer any questions you may have regarding this podcast or any of KCS's services. We're thrilled to have you listening again. As mentioned, this will be our seventh week recording this podcast, and if you're interested, previous episodes can be found at kcsbio.com. Also, if you want to keep informed of, of what's happening at KCS, you can follow us on Twitter at, at The Weekly Bio and at KCAS Bio. As we've mentioned before, we kind of started this whole thing because of social distancing gets in the way of normal communication and normal business interactions. Today, with additional guests, we actually have six of us um, all coming in from different remote locations. I'm the exception being in upstate New York, whereas all, all my five colleagues are scattered around Kansas City and the Midwest. This weekly podcast gives the chance to connect with all of you, and we hope it's a chance for you to get to know us too. And even more, is a chance for you to get to know KCS and the services we provide. As always, a review of the latest news and resources, and then a focus on a topic of our choosing. We're constantly looking for topics, and we'd be happy to discuss anything that you want us to cover. After the main topic, we'll, we'll wrap up and give you a little teaser for next week, letting you know what is coming in the future. So again, we're thrilled to have you here, and we are looking forward to a fun and fascinating episode today. To kick us off, Dom is going to go over today's podcast topic a bit before we jump into the news and resources. Dominic. Yeah, thanks, John, for that wonderful introduction. So going as John mentioned, we'll have our news and notes. But today's agenda, we'll be talking with our guests about approaches to large molecule quantitation. So we'll give a little bit of background a lot around large molecule bioanalysis. And then we'll talk a little bit about some of the case studies around when LBA might be the better tool for a, a large molecule. And when LCMS might be the better tool for a large molecule. And then we'll transition into the best of both worlds and how solving problems using both LBA in concert with the LCMS is sometimes the best approach as well. Now we'd like to move to the news and resources section. Um, as usual, we're starting with COVID-19. And first off, we want to acknowledge that the US has hit a milestone that none of us wanted to see. Recently, the mortality count for COVID-19 topped 100,000 people. We'd like to send our sincere condolences to anyone who has lost family or friends to this awful pandemic. On this, continuing on the topic of COVID, um, hydroxychloroquine continues to stay in the news, and most of it seems to be looking at hydroxychloroquine as being ineffective and, and, and actually more of a danger to, to people who are trying it out. Um, WHO suspended hydroxychloroquine trials following the publication of a, a pretty expansive uh, data analysis published in The Lancet. And then most recently, France has revoked, a, revoked the decree that authorizes hospital use for hydroxychloroquine outside clinical trials. So I don't know what your thoughts are, Dom. It looks like this is a, this is a drug that may have run its course. Well, yeah. I mean, clearly this is something that got rushed onto the scene and, you know, really isn't it is not probably working as advertised, although, you know, you still hear stories about how it had some benefit in um, other studies, but it's clear it's not going to hold up 
uh, to the rigors of a, of a true clinical trial and mo more than likely should be shelved and, and really just used for malaria. Yeah, so now focus switches back to remdesivir and, and potential combinations with that. I know that's part of Gilead's focus. Yeah, and I think there are a whole bunch of other uh, compounds being repurposed out there. I know we've got, we, we did receive our first uh, COVID positive uh, uh, patient samples from Italy. It's a compassion study. And again, it's an innate immune drug that seems to uh, really help alleviate inflammation or even the cytokine storm. So uh, that should be at least one that's impacting us directly at KCS. We have a handful of other trials that are coming, um, quite a few as I mentioned, sort of either small molecule or even large molecule drugs that seem to be targeting the ability to knock down uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines. And in one case, we had an interesting project that should be uh, kicking off here soon. And in a, in a, it's a drug that targets uh, respiratory infections and helps with alleviate any sort of immunological responses to them. So that is kind of a, to me, was a new kind of approach towards combating COVID. Excellent. I'd like to hear more about that sometime offline. Um, regarding what, what the big what big farmer are doing, Merck actually officially threw their hat into the ring this week with it saying that they are actually also developing vaccines, um, potentially to to counter COVID. They have two candidates, both of which I think one was ready to go and likely to go into clinical trials late in the year. Um, but their their CEO was in in the online interviews was very. Um, very, very much about tempering expectations. We're saying that the 12 to 18 month um, development time for vaccines is incredibly aggressive and, and really probably over optimistic, but uh, good to see another large company turning their attention to, to see what they can do to help in this, in this realm. Yeah, they're, they're a little late to the game, but certainly have the uh, bandwidth and the uh, horsepower to get caught up. And what did I see? I think there are seven trials now in humans and over 130 or 140 in the preclinical setting and you know a lot of them poised to get into human trials so that's exciting and i hope there's a vaccine as soon as possible but again you know that this is like don't expect one in 2020 or even 2021 but maybe somebody can prove me wrong there again i think it takes a couple years and even that is at lightning speed relative to you know, some of the other vaccines that have uh, hit the market in the last, say, decade. Exactly. And more worrying was a, was a topic that you, you raised. Can you go ahead on that one, Dom? Sure. It was interesting to read that nearly half of all Americans have delayed medical care due to the pandemic. I think this is something that had always kind of been in the back of my mind around, you know, I have a sister who's a nurse at Mass General Hospital in Boston, and she was indicating to me that, yeah, I don't know where all the sick patients are going. It just Apparently, they're all just staying at home, which is some not just concerning. I, I, I think it's really troubling to think about, you know, individuals who are probably getting proactive treatment or even treatment and they're just foregoing it. I think that's part of maybe the reason why you're seeing this spike in the death rate. I, I think it's compounding the issue. And let's hope we can start to loosen up, you know, the restrictions on things, at least in terms of getting people into the hospital. I'm not saying we should all go partying like we saw in the Lake of Ozarks. You know, I, I think when it comes to individuals getting to the hospital, I hope they can make it out there as soon as possible. And and as a side note, even my um, my brother who is having some eye issues, he, he's in Colorado and he got out to see the doctor finally. And the individual in front of him who was going to get an eye exam, they refused to treat him because he was a healthcare worker who had seen COVID patients. This I find to be something that is really interesting in terms of the impact of having people who are out there at the front line who are now being denied medical service. Wow, that just seems tragic to me. That's, that sounds awful to me. I mean, I, I, it's scary. I, when, when you talk to people even before COVID, it's amazing how often you talk to someone and say, I've got this, this niggle or whatever, the symptom, but I don't want to go to the doctor about it. And it's like, well, if you've got a symptom, get yourself checked out because you just, you've got no hand on what it is. But this almost gives people the excuse to, to put it off and put it off and put it off. And for some things, it could be too late. Uh, I mean, you, you, yeah, I just would never advise that. Yeah. And, you, you know, there's always the, meningitis cases that you hear about or people that go into the hospital and get sicker. Hopefully that's not what's deterring people. But I agree with you. There's a large number of people and 
maybe even sometimes myself included, uh, where I'm just like, ah, oh, it doesn't hurt that bad. I don't want to go. But man, I, I can't imagine being refused uh, health care uh, due to, you know, doing your job. So yeah, the, the health care the healthcare worker thing really bothers me, particularly coming from the UK. And, uh, you know, it, the UK has struggled with with personal protective equipment, same as here. And, and I think there's a, an account on Twitter that actually uh, acknowledges each health worker who's died in the course of this this pandemic. And it's a substantial number of people. And, and that that's really troubling. You know, people have gone to work to help people and they've ended up losing their lives because of it. And and to find out that then they're being refused service because of other, other med, if they have a genuine medical conditions, that's, that's, that's nightmarish. Shall we move on to the non-COVID stuff? Yeah, that, that, let's let's definitely do that. This is an interesting one. Why don't you go? You discovered this one. Very very quick snippet. Not really much to say, but in and following on from um, the WRIB meeting, which has gone virtual, another of our our significant events during the calendar year, the Land of Lakes Conference in Wisconsin, has also now um, announced that it's going virtual in July. So a lot of people who are planning on that meeting which combines golf with science um that that they unfortunately aren't going to have that opportunity it's always funny when you say golf with science i mean that that's that's just like you know oil and water to me i don't know about you john but i haven't met too many scientists with a good golf game <laughs> i've never golfed so yeah I, I can't comment on that uh i i do it although you know one of our guests interestingly enough is actually a very good golfer so additionally in the news unrelated to COVID was Gilead comes out with a big, uh, I guess, acquisition. They, they spent upwards of $2 billion to acquire a company called Arcus. Arcus has a real hot immunological target called Tigit. So they have an antibody against Tigit, which Tigit is a T-cell immune receptor with Ig and ITAM. ITIM domains. It's a checkpoint inhibitor. It's similar to PDL, PDL1 pathway. And so this is a really neat antibody against TIGET. And it is used, putatively been very successful in conjunction with the anti PD1 antibody. So again, we see more dollars being invested. And, in, you know, outside of Gilead's Remdesivir hitting the news, they, they strike a nice deal uh, to acquire a new asset. Yeah, it's interesting to watch Gilead, who made their made their money on anti antivirals, how they are branching out and and basically, you know, making themselves uh, going into other spaces to to help grow the company. Yeah, certainly a juggernaut, and like you said, the the antivirals are, I think, still maybe their bread and butter, but like you said, they are certainly branching out into immunoecology at a very high rate. So to close out our news and notes, one more interesting topic. And, you know, we talked about how the pharma industry is being big uptick in um, how it's being viewed by the public. Now, in April, they went out and spent uh, a whole bunch of money on advertisements, right? So it looks like um, somewhere in there, somewhere north of $183 million in April was spent by large pharma uh, that's up 17% from March, and that's all in the TV ad space. Of course, TV ad space has to be getting uh, more attention with everybody being at home, but that that's quite a bit of money uh, to be spent, and it was led by AbbVie. Uh, I just thought it was kind of interesting and you know, kind of plays in nicely with how the farmer's view is being increased, and now they seem to be trying to continue that momentum. Yeah, I I, th- I saw that too and thought it was it was interesting. I wonder how effective it is when when so many of us really spend more time with Netflix and Hulu and, and other other sources. So I, I, I'd I'd love to. I don't know the the um the impact of of TV advertising with drug companies and and how it helps them, but it would be interesting to know. It's certainly it's certainly watching you know standard TV is is none of my kids' practice at all. Yeah, I guess the only one in my household that watches it is the wife. She watches her standard networks, and I've seen some of these commercials on there as I'm either in the room or nodding off at night. So anyhow, <laughs> that'll do it for our news and notes. So excited today! We have our first guests to our podcast. That is Dr. Don Dufield and Franklin Spriggs. What a pleasure it is to welcome them to our humble podcast this week. So as, as, as a bit of background, uh, Dawn heads up her Biopharma LCMS team and Frank head, heads up her Biopharma LBA team. 
Um, just as a quick uh, intro to what we're what we're planning on doing, uh, Dom, Dom and I will largely take a back seat and we'll lead. Uh, let Frank and Don talk mostly about um, large molecule bioanalysis cases where LBA is a better format than LCMS. Um, cases where actually where LCMS is is more beneficial than LBA, and and from our perspective, the, the most powerful combination of it all where we actually use both technologies to solve an issue. So Don, why don't you start us off and tell us a little bit about yourself? And when you're done, Frank, why don't you introduce yourself to our podcast audience? Great. Thanks, Don. So uh, I joined KCAS um, a little bit about two years ago, um, started a group doing large molecule LCMS primarily um, focused on proteins and peptides, but also doing some biomarker panels and small molecules. Um, Previous to that, I had spent over 20 years um, at Pfizer doing a similar type of approach where I would do quantitative LCMS. Frank Spriggs, I have um, been at KCAS for about three years now, but I started my career in a small uh, uh, biotech company where we did gene analysis and finding the druggable genome um, before moving into uh, the regulated LBA space um, at Amgen for a couple years. Um, And then a little similarity to Dawn, we um, crossed paths before when I was at Pfizer for um, a a period of time uh, where we both worked together in one of the sites at Pfizer before I took the step into the CRO space where I've been working over the last five years running large molecule or LBA uh, departments. Yeah, so I guess I'll start with a little bit of a a background about um, hybrid LCMS. So this is an area um, that has been around for literally over 20 years. Um, I actually have personal experience doing it um, dating back to about 2000. Um, But I would say more generally in the industry, um, probably in the last five, six, seven years, it's become um, more routinely done and more widely um, needed to be done. More people have been interested in doing this. And so then in the last few years, I would say the CRO space has also um, gotten involved to be able to develop these types of assays. Um, The nice thing about these assays is they're very um, complementary to an LBA approach. So uh, one of the things that Frank and I discuss a lot is, you know, which one should we uh, go after and how do you know uh, when to do one over the other? And so I would say um, many times, you know, we'll, we'll start a conversation with a client and decide, you know, maybe they come in thinking, oh, I wanna do this by LCMS or vice versa. They wanna do it by LBA. And typically, we'll have a conversation with them to say, um, which one do you think might be uh, the best approach? Uh, Frank, do you want to expand on that at all? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Don. It's a great uh, um, introduction to the LCMS side of it and, and where it's come from. Um, perspective from the LBA side, my career, we it's 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 been kind of funny being on the other side because yes, the the mass spec um, has been coming up through the ranks and th- uh, into be a more popular platform. And the time that I've spent in the LBA space, it's always been a just because you can doesn't mean you should um, discussion. And the nice thing that that has evolved now that LCMS has become more. Um, widespread use for large molecule bioanalysis or for biopharma space is that 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 headbutting that competition is is fading and it is becoming a conversation of what is what what are you looking for what are you trying to achieve with this assay what is your timeline um, so it's it's been interesting on the other side but I think there was a lot of of headbutting to begin with when LCMS started to get get traction and become a more widespread technology. Um, did you see something similar, Don? Yeah, so I think, again, um, a lot of times when you talk to people, they're, they come in, as you said, with a preconceived notion of, um, you know, everything should be done by LBA or everything should be done by LCMS. And I think um, 
what needs to happen and what is happening at KCAS is, you know, we need to have a good conversation with some of these questions that help steer people into the right technology. Because just because, like you said, there's many projects that could be done by either technology and probably either would work. But there's definitely going to be cases where ideally or out of the gate, it may look like one is a better um, approach to start with. And so sometimes, you know, having those upfront conversations with a with a group that understands both technologies is key to really, um, you know, getting the right technology chosen as early as possible. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting how territorial people get about their technologies. I remember I went on a, a, a sales call to a company in Denmark who shall remain nameless, but we know the area of, of interest that will be obvious, um, to talk about our, an insulin assay that we had by LCMS. Um, we could meet the levels that, that really were, were published with, by LBA assays and we had additional specificity. So for, you know, any amended insulins, um, we, we really had a solid assay, but it was like talking to brick wall to the, the people there because they were LBA people. They had a, they had a, a, a very developed um, LBA team and they, they also said, well, we, we can get any antibodies that we want because we've got a really uh, strong uh, pipeline for for bringing for, for basically developing any antibodies so it, the, the actual visit went nowhere but it was it was interesting that again i i'm a great believer in the complementary nature of the two two technologies and even though lcms in this case could probably offer more it was it was it was going to go nowhere as a, as, a, as a conversation yeah so i think um one other thing i would add to that i guess is you know, I think you mentioned they had a good LBA team, right? So a lot of people's experience will also be on the um, places where they've put these types of assays in the past, whether it's internal or at a CRO, and how successful they have been, right? So they may, let's say, have put it in an area where somebody was trying to do hybrid LCMS. And if that particular group doesn't have the expertise to really understand all the pitfalls and places to, to really look for um, solutions, they may have had a negative experience and therefore clouded kind of their future perspective on that technology. So again, I think it's, it's both critical to know um, which one might be the best one, but then also to have teams that are able to deliver in both areas um, equally well so that you're really choosing the best technology and delivering it at the same time. I think the other aspect of, of that is not just comfort level of the group that is looking to quantitate that protein, but it's also what protein you're quantitating and what is the history of that as it's been submitted and approved in the FDA? Are you going back and cross-referencing um, previous studies that maybe were done by LBA? So then there's, there's an added level of anxiety. Um, that can come in if all of that work has been done. So insulin is is a great example of this, John, is that a lot of insulin is done by radio immunoprecipitation assays. Um, that is, I think everyone would agree that it had its heyday, it has its place today still, but there are other ways that can actually get you that sensitivity and get you uh, what you need for an insulin assay or an insulin analog assay. But the FDA is used to seeing that and and not having to re to introduce a new technology and have to compare that back uh, that back data to it and do extra work to get the comfort from the agency. I think is also um, one of the factors that goes into which platform to use. I think that's an excellent point because we've seen that not just in the case of analysis, but things like dry blood spots, et cetera, that, that trying to, 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 to get the agency to go along where you, where, where you think the science is going to go, but they, they're still that bit more conservative in approach. Yeah. And I guess the other thing to add there is I think it, it's kind of a double-edged sword, right? On the one hand, you have maybe a gold standard that you're going to compare to, but on the other hand, you have a newer technology that could offer you um, better uh, solutions. And so really um, laying the groundwork and creating the right science to to showcase that, I think, is is key to our job. You know, many times you'll see, um, let's say, a technology, you know, there's interleukins, for example, in the literature that 
you know, somehow have been detected. Um, but then when you get into a more specific assay, we find out that those might have been artifacts. So um, I think, you know, balancing that gold standard with the newer approaches is really going to be key to, um, you know, bringing everything to the direction it needs to go. To be fair, it's it's not just a platform um, thing either. Um, you look at, at biosimilars and doing ADA assays, biosimilars, um, uh, the technology in the LBA space has evolved as quickly as the LCMS space has um, with the sensitivity of the instruments and the quality of the instruments. Um, so assays developed by LBA today for something that was developed 10 years ago is going to be much more sensitive and the data is going, you're going to have to have some extra wording around how to compare the data between them because time goes on and technologies advance, science continues to advance, and we learn new things, new platforms in the LBA space alone. So through electrochemiluminescence or fluorescence, um, things like a uh, um, SMCX Pro where you can get very, very low quantities of, uh, of some cytokines. Yeah, I agree. So I guess maybe we should take a step back and, and um, talk a little bit about, at least for hybrid LCMS, you know, give the, the listeners a perspective on what is hybrid LCMS or amino affinity LCMS, or also it's sometimes called amino capture. It's got like 10 different names, which also makes it more complicated. But um, essentially what it is, is combining um, the mass spec, which has been around for forever, with some type of enrichment or um, affinity capture step. So it's kind of this combination between what we traditionally think of as a ligand binding assay using um, an antibody or some type of capture reagent and then a detector. And in our case, we have the detector is the mass spec. So instead of having a second antibody in many cases, which um, Frank can elaborate on for the LBA approach, we have um, the mass spec, which is our second quote unquote um, antibody or detector. And the advantage of doing um, the mass spec, there's several different advantages, but but specifically to that piece is around, um, you're, you're able to dial in essentially the specificity. So you don't have to take three months or six months to raise an antibody to a specific epitope. You just kind of pick which particular peptide or sequence you want to go after and you look for that in the mass spec. So that can be done, you know, in an afternoon. So it, it becomes very um, easy for the second piece uh, compared to an LBA. Yeah, I think there there are, you know, with the LBA space and technology, yeah, yeah you need a couple binding agents, um, whether it be the target of the drug or it be an antibody to the drug uh, and then some way to detect that uh, that drug and, and create a, a sandwich as it's appropriately called. Um, that can be a limitation. Um, however, early on, especially non-clinical species, you know, it's very easy to work on, work on those, especially if you're looking at monoclonal antibody. Um, in a non-clinical species, you you can look at anti-human antibodies, and you can get most of those commercially available. Um, so the turn on that is pretty quick because you don't have to raise totally new antibodies. Um, a lot of protein replacement therapies, there are reagents out there for it. You don't you aren't spending that extra time and that extra money generating those reagents up front. Um, yeah, I think there's there's great opportunity in, in the LBA space for that. Um, but I think using the using mass spec as a detector, and, and I think that is a, a fantastic way for, for those, those of us in the LBA space and know what a mass spec looks like, but that's about the end of their mass spec knowledge, um, can, can visualize that and understand that, that you're doing ligand binding assay up front you're just not using some kind of reporter or conjugate. You're using a giant complex machine to detect. Yeah, and I guess, you know, um, one thing you mentioned about like a replacement therapy that, that's um, 
uniquely interesting from a, an LCMS or a hybrid mass spec approach is many times, let's say you'll have um, a drug, I mean, a, a protein that's in the body that maybe has a slightly different sequence. So maybe the endogenously produced um, protein in the disease state is off by two or three amino acids, which is why maybe it's not functional. And then typically the replacement drug might have, you know, the correct sequence. And many times you'll find, let's say, an existing or even a, a newly generated antibody may or not be able to differentiate that small amino acid change. So that's one area where uh, hybrid LCMS can be very advantageous. So you could essentially do a, a capture step with, let's say, that antibody, and maybe it binds both the, the disease state and the, the drug. And then you can um, follow that up with a digestion to go after that specific uh, fragment piece. And then you can use the mass spec to specifically differentiate those two peptides. And so in that particular case, you know, it may be one of these questions we'd asked up front, that might be a place where hybrid LCMS might be more advantageous because you expect some small change that maybe an antibody wouldn't uh, be able to differentiate. I think a, 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 an advantage that LBA has over LCMS in, in some cases is where you're looking at either fusion protein or bispecific, tri-specific, multi-specific uh, molecules where you need to understand that the molecule is completely intact. Um, where, you know, doing any kind of digestion or modification of it other than maybe a precipitation down, but measuring that total whole protein. And some of those fusion proteins that, that we see nowadays are enormous. Um, to be able to get the sensitivity and be able to say with some level of confidence that the uh, that the molecule is fully intact, I think is um, more straightforward by LBA than LCMS. Uh, would you agree with that, Dawn, or am I uh, totally off base there? No, absolutely. I, I feel like um, the general approach for hybrid LCMS is what we call a surrogate peptide approach, which basically means we are digesting the protein into smaller pieces, and then we measure a piece of that protein as representative of the protein. And so to your point, if we're not measuring every little piece of it, which typically we're not, then we may miss a subtlety that you'd be able to pick up. But I guess on the flip side, you know, an LBA is only as good as the epitope it's measuring, right? So you don't necessarily know you have the whole thing intact either, unless, you know, that um, structure confirms some three-dimensional shape that allows your antibody to bind. So um, I think, again, it, it depends on the specific question, and that would be something where you would, you know, have a very specific discussion and say, what exactly are you trying to measure? Let's say, for example, you know, um, a specific part of the molecule may be more susceptible to instability. Well, then you can develop an assay through um, either, probably both uh, LBA or LCMS, where you're going after that um, particular area, be it through a, a binding partner or through a mass spec peptide. So I think, um, again, these, these, these two technologies are very complementary, and in many cases, both could potentially solve your problem. One may be a little bit more straightforward and one may be a little bit more complicated, um, but there's definitely cases, you know, that you and I have worked on where one we started didn't work so great and, and we pivoted to the other one pretty quickly and were successful. So I think, um, you know, generally it's, it's really about having the right conversation, asking the right questions, and then understanding what each of the technologies really is measuring, right? So we're measuring pieces of the protein by chopping it up. LBA technically is measuring pieces as well by detecting an epitope. Now that can be a, a primary sequence epitope or a, or a tertiary sequence epitope. Yeah, I thought I'd jump in quick. That, this is some great stuff. So I think what I want to maybe summarize a little bit before maybe we jump into some case studies, it seems to me like one of the major Re rationales for maybe leaning towards the affinity capture uh, LCMS would be in instances where you have endogenous proteins that mimic the drug. That seems like an obvious one, as well as any sort of issues with 
you know, maybe having small pieces of what I call real estate where um, you can't get a good antibody pair to work. And then on the flip side, if you have a rather large molecule and not just your traditional monoclonal antibody where there is nice tools for the LCMS team, if it's more of a, what we'll call a Frankenstein or a some sort of uh, chimeric or fusion protein, which has a lot of valencies, that might be some of the advantages on the LBA side. So that, I, I hope I summarize some of that right. I think that's just scratching the surface. Maybe now do we want to um, start talking a little bit about, I think, Don, you alluded to some case studies. Do we want to jump into that or what else would you guys like to continue before we move into some specifics? Yeah, I think we can do some case studies, but I think there's a, a couple other things that are worth um, kind of covering maybe at a high level. So, you know, for example, we talked about, um, you know, trying to pick up front the right um, technology and some of the specific questions. Maybe I'll start with a few and then, you know, Frank, you can chime in with a few more. Um, but, you know, really the first question we would ask them is, you know, what, like we said earlier, what are you really trying to measure? And, and specifically, you know, is it an instability? Does it have a different sequence? Is it, you know, unique to a, a, a binding site or an active site or something like that? Are you looking at a bound, you know, molecule or a free molecule? I think those are some of the questions. Um, you know, one of the first questions we always ask is, do you have reagents? Because clearly if you have no reagents, you pretty much can't do an LBA assay. Um, so that's usually one of the one of the first questions, and, and I guess maybe we haven't said it specifically, but for um, typically for an LBA, you want two good reagents, right? Whereas for mass spec, to do an immunocapture or affinity capture or an enrichment, you really only need one, and it actually doesn't have to be great. It just has to be good enough to clean it up to some level because the detector is ultimately going to give you the specificity to tell you exactly the sequence that you're looking at. So Frank, you want to maybe comment on a few other um, kind of questions that we ask up front? Yeah, and I, th I think a maybe a variation of that that main big question of what are you trying to measure? Um, also, I'd like to to ask what is the question you're trying to answer? Um, because sometimes sometimes the two uh, the two answers for those two questions are not. Um, are not complementary to each other. Um, sometimes if you're looking to, you want to measure something, but you're trying to answer a question, there might be something else you can measure, which may be more suitable for um, one technology or the other. Um, and I, yeah, absolutely. LBA needs two reagents. We need one that is at least moderately good. They don't both have to be great. We at least need one that allows us to get that specificity through the uh, through that epitope binding to make sure that there's no cross reactivity. Um, yeah, that's that is. I I don't know if I would call it the limitation, but that is certainly one of the requirements that, that an LBA needs. Is it is all based off of that binding, um, and and the kinetics of that binding. So I think, you know, a couple of the other questions that I that I like to ask up front, um, at least for um, for LCMS assay would be I need to know, you know, what sequence you have. Are there unique sequences? You know, as I mentioned earlier, when we were talking about the um, replacement therapy approach, you know, is there some unique sequence that we have to go after? Because this will determine whether we can go after the best peptide that's a representative of that protein or if we have to go after a specific peptide. So sometimes the specific peptide might be it's the only difference between, you know, the, the drug and the um, endogenous or maybe it's the only difference between sino and a humanized drug. So sometimes we're very limited in, um, in our approaches and knowing those sequence um, specificities will help us and LCMS is easily um, tunable to take advantage of those slight modifications in peptide or amino acid sequence to allow assays, let's say, to be translated from, you know, one species to another. When I think sometimes, Frank, maybe you can comment if, if that sometimes we can become a challenge um, with an LBA assay that might work well in one species, but not work so well in a different. 
Yeah, generally, LBA-wise, as the matrix gets closer to human, meaning, um, you know, starting in mouse and rat, moving to um, sino and then to human, you um, encounter additional challenges um, that, that, you know, we were able to get through and to, to solve, but to your point, Don, um, they are, I don't know if it is, if I'd say easier, but they are less likely to be as a large of a, uh, of a problem or as large of an issue to, to get over that hurdle. Uh, the one thing I do want to mention is because I, I think listening to, to all of this, there's going to be a lot of, well, it sounds like LCMS is, is the, the bee's knees and the be all end all. Um, but with anything, there's always a opposite side of it. Right. And I think one of the things that we, we, we talk about internally, and, and I don't know how aware other people are of this is that there's a significant difference in time and cost. Um, with reagents available, time and cost for an LBA method is lower. Um, time and cost for an LCMS method is, is going to, it is usually going to take more time, not always. Um, rule of thumb, it is going to take more time. And definitely per sample analysis is going to be more expensive, um, I'd say 95% of the time when it's going to go with the LCMS uh, platform. Yeah, so I, I fully agree with that. I mean, if we talk a little bit about uh, some of the advantages and disadvantages, right, we were kind of talking agnostically about which technology could answer specific questions. I think, um, as you said, when I get involved a lot of times and when hybrid LCMS is required, it's typically when LBA hasn't been successful. So many times we'll first start trying to go by LBA because, as you said, it might be faster, cheaper, simpler. And then they run into an interference or a snag or something, right? And then we pivot and switch to LCMS. Um, as you said, I think generally on a per sample cost, it's probably a little bit more expensive. Um, clearly, the instrumentation is much more expensive, right? So you have some capital investment that's required to do, um, you know, high sensitive mass spec, which you may also have some with your MSDs or your um, Samoas or whatever, you know, your LBA platforms also can have some of that, but you can also get away with some cheaper versions um, and not have to go with that much of an expense. Um, so for sure, there's definitely some advantages. And the other thing you mentioned, I think, was kind of the time. And so one thing to remember for LCMS is it's going to be sequential, right? So every sample is injected one at a time. So you can do your sample prep in a batch or let's say in a plate, but each one then will be injected one after the other. So even if your runtime is five or 10 minutes, you know, that's going to take you 15 hours, let's say, to get through a plate, whereas typically you guys, you know, read the whole plate at one time. So definitely from a, a throughput standpoint, I believe, you know, um, a plate based LBA should be much faster, but it's not um, complete, completely prohibited to go to LCMS. It's just a little bit more sequential. So we do try to keep our methods somewhere between four and 10 minutes to, to make them um, reasonable from a throughput standpoint. You know, I, I, I'm sitting here thinking about there, there was a um, recent uh, case study or a recent um, assay that I know we worked on that um, you know, we tried that, that LBA approach and, and tried it for a couple weeks working to get a, a sensitive assay for a um, relatively small protein um, biomarker. Um, and we tried it, we even tried it with our um, high sensitive technologies that we have with the SMCX Pro. Um, and we were just not able to um, achieve that, that desired sensitivity or robustness of it at the desired sensitivity. Um, that was a case where, yeah, as, as you were mentioning that LCMS is the, uh, when LBA, isn't able to uh, to accomplish a goal, um, you know, switching over to another platform, 
can potentially uh, um, get that goal. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, there's definitely cases, you know, if we start talking about case studies where where we can do a couple different things, right? We may pick up front based on these questions, you know, let's go with LCMS or let's go with LBA. And maybe, like you said, a couple weeks in, we realize, okay, we're running into some issues. And so we can quickly pivot um, because we're all kind of in the same labs and in the same space. So it's easy to, you know, pivot from one technology to the other um, and then be able to successfully develop that. So we've, we've had that case study. We had one that actually was a small molecule um, leukotriene where same thing. We tried to do it by LBA and I don't know if it was just a kid or if it was a homegrown assay, but um, in that particular case, I think there were some interferences that happened to be isomers of the molecule. And we were able to successfully deliver an assay by uh, mass spec. And in this case, it was actually the LC that gave us the specificity because the mass spec of all the isomers are the same as well. But we were able to chromatographically separate the isomers in order to get um, what we needed for that particular assay. So we definitely have have those cases. But as you know, we had a case where we were looking at a pegylated protein and we tried to do that by LCMS. And because of the peg, it seemed to interfere with our approaches for digesting things efficiently. And essentially, we spent a few weeks, again, you know, had an assay that was, I would say, okay, it was reasonable, but not quite um, as rugged and reproducible as we would have liked to have seen. And again, that's one where we pivoted to uh, an LBA assay. And, and maybe, Frank, you can talk about kind of what that assay ended up uh, looking like. Yeah, and that and you know that assay when it came from LCMS over to LBA, you know, I'm not going to to lie and say that was a it was tricky LBA method as well. Um, really, for kind of the same reasons that we had trouble in the uh, in the LCMS space is getting antibodies that could bind that that protein in a way that allowed us to build the sandwich was difficult because getting an antibody to that that peg portion of the drug was um, causing some steric hindrance and and I think there is some epitope sharing between a lot of the antibodies that we tried on it but um, eventually we ended up prevailing and and uh, finding that perfect pair of antibodies which in this case this is this is a great example of um, we had one, reagent from the customer that was specific and then we screened about 15 commercial antibodies for that uh, detector uh, and screening through that that was again we didn't have two great reagents we had one reagent that we knew had some specificity and we were able to screen through a bunch of other commercial to find the the pair that gave us the answer that we were looking for yeah, I think these are, are, are really good examples of, um, you know, where having the ability to do both technologies equally well has been key for us to um, support our clients efficiently. And so, you know, we also have talked and, and have a couple clients where, you know, sometimes up front, you don't know what's the best one, right? Because it could be similar and we don't know the quality of reagents. And so we have um, definitely had conversations and, and started a couple projects where we'll spend a week or two in parallel working on both projects, both technologies, and see, you know, if you get a clear winner out, you know, after a week of experiments, sometimes one drops out much faster than the other. And if they both look promising, then obviously you can go to time and cost really to help you drive your decision. So um, I think it's really, you know, not, like you said, not one's better than the other. They're just very complementary. In some cases, um, similar results can be provided. In some cases, one works and one doesn't. So I think it's really important to, to um, always think of both of them and, and what, which one can help you uh, best in which situation. Yeah, this is great, guys. I, I think you, you really hit a lot of um, items here. And uh, one in particular, a couple things I'd like to recap real quick is that, you know, you mentioned the leukotriene um, measurement. That was a really you know, we kind of gla glazed over what we had done on the LBA side, but we tried, I think, three or four platforms, maybe like four, at least three or four different ELISA sources, and really it never got to the need uh, of um, the level of 
sensitivity that you were able to produce by affinity capture mass spectron. So that's really, uh, I think, a good when you think of that was a biomarker instance, but even in the uh, PK space, that was an instance where the antibody capture was either not quite good enough and certainly due to the real estate restrictions because leukotrienes or even masking of what it bound to because it's kind of a promiscuous thing or has multiple uh, metabolites to it, that that's a great story around where LCMS was a clear-cut path forward. And then on the flip side, things like PEGs or other compounds in there that are attached to drugs that might become a little bit sticky on the LCMS, they become challenging. So I just wanted to hammer that home. And then Don, I think you got, you started to go down the last item on our agenda, which is the best of both worlds. So um, I don't know which one of you wants to kick that off, but I do think, and I, I know there's a story we have where we looked at both of them and then one emerged, but that that's really the power of uh, not only what we can do at KCS, but having the ability of both platforms to sort of work in parallel. Yeah, I, I would, um, as far as having both the platforms and the power of that, um, there is one project that uh, we are working on currently um, that is is uh, pretty extensive. And, you know, we're looking at total proteins, phosphoproteins, um, and we're doing it together. Um, you know, LBA, there are some, some kits and reagents available for about half of those um, of those proteins and those phospho total um, assessments. And the other half, there's not, um, or at least not good reagents for it. So that's a case where it's, you know, single study that we're doing both, um, you know, protein mass spec or, or uh, uh, assessment by mass spec as well as by LBA. Um, and as we run into issues, we actually talk to each other and see, hey, do you have anything that we might be able to use? Or, hey, do you think there's something in this that, that you can you can solve for us? Yeah, absolutely. I, I would say um, a couple things there. So in this particular case, you know, one of the things that's essential for an LCMS assay is you have to have a good peptide to be able to follow, right? And, and you have to know um, which peptide that is and what post-translational modifications it might have, in this case, phosphorylation. Um, in this particular case, there's a lot of different phosphorylations very closely in a, in a similar peptide. So there's, you know, 24 different possible combinations for us to look at, which makes, you know, it very difficult from an aspect perspective, but that's one where um, maybe, again, we share reagents, we've kind of screened some things, and LBA can pick up and um, and take off in that particular area. I would say one of the other things we haven't really touched on is um, ADCs. So, you know, um, ADCs have been around for several years now and, and typically use both technologies as part of its characterization assays. Usually it's a suite of assays. So, um, in the past, you know, the, I would say the general assays most places require are the actual ADC, so the antibody drug conjugate, the free payload, an ADA, and then maybe the total or naked antibody, right? So typically the free payload is done by mass spec and the ADA is typically done by an LBA approach, but the other two could go either way. And again, it, it very much depends. Sometimes they're um, just as good one way or the other. But sometimes, you know, because um, maybe there's not a good reagent or something, we, we've had to go down the mass spec route. So we kind of have some of those examples as well where, you know, there wasn't a good um, antibody to the payload. And so we could do that by mass spec by doing an antibody to the, the antibody, to the total antibody or the naked antibody, but then detect very specifically the peptide with the payload attached. Um, so again, there's, there's, there's definite things and it really all goes back to what, you know, Frank was saying and I was saying at the beginning is what's the question and what are you actually trying to measure? And then we can have the appropriate conversations to say, okay, well, if you don't have a reagent for this, you may be limited and you have to go down this path or, or vice versa. So um, it's really about, I think, understanding what you're measuring, what you're trying to measure, and then what you know, kind of tools you have um, to allow you to do that. 
I, I think ADCs are a fascinating topic. Maybe we should be thinking about an, a, rev- a return visit to talk through them as, a, as the main topic of the day. Yeah, it's a huge, it's a huge space for bioanalytical challenges. Yeah, there are definitely uh, challenges all over the place with ADCs in the LBA space and the LCMS space, um, you know, potentially sharing samples across them, um, different stabilities uh, based on, you know, payloads tend not to be terribly stable once uh, they're off the ADC. Yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a good hour long discussion just there. Oh, oh, John, I think you opened the door up to bring our guests back in a few weeks. I, I love that idea. Well, that, that does it for the main portion of our podcast today. I think it's been a wonderful conversation. I want to thank our guests so much for joining us today. I think it was a little bit easier on John and I. We got to take a back seat. Yeah, thanks, Tom. It was, uh, it was great to be part of this. Um, I think maybe I'll get myself stuck into doing a few more of these, so <laughs> get, get used to it, I guess. I, I can guarantee that. Yeah, and, and, and I will... Uh... I will also say thank you very much for uh, for having us, and and I uh, am willing to and able to come back whenever you guys uh, have uh, more LBA things that you want to get into, uh, take a diver deeper dive into. I'd be happy to come back uh, if you'll have me. Careful what you wish for. I'm sure you'll be seeing an invite for an ADC podcast here soon. So that does it for the main portion. Usually, this is when we have our feedback from fans, but. We'll blame the holiday for not having any of that. But all of you that do listen to the podcast, we really do appreciate the feedback. So please do continue to have them and ask us those questions. Of course, we can't finish a podcast without mentioning my favorite thing, John. What's my favorite thing, John? Uh, Music, movies. I don't know. I have no idea. Fill me in. No, on the pizza front, there's still no yeast in the grocery stores. I mean, I, I, I don't know what to say. I, I made my last pizza pie. And so hopefully this week I'm a little hesitant. I might be having to like, you know, go to the local pizza shop and see if they've got any for me or something, or maybe I'll have to buy some dough again, but that's, that's never my favorite thing to do. So are you, are you back to eating a box of dry Triscuits or something like that? <laughs> oh, John, you don't know me at all. I, I don't know about you, but this weekend I got out and, uh, you know, we're in Kansas city. So I'm in the the meat, uh, the smoking capital of the world. And I smoked some ribs and I mean, they, they were uh, probably my best ever. I, the, I, I got to the point where the bone fell right off of them. I almost had pulled pork out of it, but it's like a, you know, a three day process. You gotta, for me, I, I first, I usually freeze the rib and, and do it at some point, but I got to thaw it. And then overnight I wrap it in saran wrap and rub it. And that's a nice little trick. And then you got to the day of smoking, you got to leave it out for a couple hours to acclimate it to room temperature. And then when I get done smoking it for a good three or four hours, I cheat a little bit, at least traditional smokers say I do. And I wrap it in some foil and then I heat it in the oven for a little bit and let it finish. And that's how it falls apart. I like it nice and tender like that. So there's a little lesson on smoking meat for you. I guess I could pivot from pizza eventually. It sounds sounds really good. Although I have to say when it comes to barbecue, I'm an Eastern North Carolina man myself. I love the, love the, the vinegary touch is what's key. Don't, don't say that too loud in the shop, John. And, and you know, on a side note, this was the first weekend I actually got out of the house, too. I, we had a little uh, neighborhood, uh, excuse me, the neighbor next door had about four couples over. So there were eight of us observing some nice social distance in a driveway, you know, having some vibrations and uh, enjoying ourselves on a um, Sunday evening. It almost felt uh, a little bit normal, although it was, you know, keeping the distance and all that. How about you, John? Any, do you do anything? You know, it's not as exciting as, you know, maybe going away to a cabin or something like I normally would want to do. But Yeah, no, no mixing with other people. It's just sort of generally doing things around the, around the house, etc. And our garden hasn't had as much attention in the last 20 years as it's having right now. But you do, you, you, that's what you do when you, when, you can't, when you can't go very far from home base. No, oh, absolutely. I've got six new rose bushes that I planted for Mother's Day, so I feel you there. And uh, Don and Frank, you guys want to add anything around what you did this uh, Memorial Day weekend? I did the same as you. We did some barbecuing and um, did smoke some ribs and had a little kind of outdoor um, picnic, I guess, with, with some family. Yeah, I did some smoking over uh, Mother's Day, so I took a break from that and went to uh, just grilled up some uh, grilled up some steaks and 
Hey Dom, if you really need it, I have I have some yeast sitting in my fridge that uh, that that is uh, looking to be used, and I haven't been making bread lately. So, oh, you just made my day, Frank. This is amazing. I'm so glad I brought it up. Look at me. I'm like I get it at candy shop now. Well, that'll do it for podcast number seven, part three of three in our series in what is bioanalysis. I want to thank our guests for attending this week. It was exceptional to have them here, and really appreciate them taking the time out of their busy schedules to spend some time with us here on our wonderful podcast. Leading into next week's topic, we'll be discussing why a one-stop bioanalytical shop and the advantages of using it. Also, some of the benefits of working with a mid to smaller size bioanalytical shop. John, what did you think of this week and what about next week's topics? Well, it'd be good to have a good next week to talk about something completely different but I have to say today has been excellent I really enjoyed everything that Don and Frank contributed and thanks very much to both of you for joining us and hopefully sometime in the not too distant future we'll have other people join us to, to discuss other topics of interest 